Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I think so. Uh, hi, welcome. We'll go ahead and get things kicked off here. Um, our session is called the ASU Helios Decision Center for Educational Excellence, um, Data in Action from Visualization to Impact. Uh, my name is Chris Ozuna, and maybe this will work. Let's see. Uh, my name is Chris Ozuna, and I work for the Decision Center for Educational Excellence. I'm a strategic data project fellow that's been with the center for a little over two years. And I'll let my colleague Don introduce herself. Hi, I'm Dr. Don Foley, and I am the research project manager who's new to this team. I come to this team with about 30 years of experience in education, most recently a school superintendent, recovering school superintendent after four years during the COVID era, which is a lot of fun. Um, but we are very excited to share with you today the work that we have and that we do as part of our center to impact those that we work with. Um, and we're kind of excited to show you um, what what we're about and what we've done. So just to give you a little bit of a description about our center itself, we are a partnership between Arizona State University and the Helios Education Foundation, uh, which is, I think, the largest um, education funder in the state of Arizona. Uh, we work on a variety of projects. We have um, a line of what we call impact projects, where we take some of the data tools that we use and sort of model good um, database decision making, mostly in K-12 schools. But really the bread and butter of what we do are our tools and visualizations. Um, and that's what we're going to talk to you about today. We have this portfolio of tools and visualizations, many of them that we have built in partnership with the Decision Theater Network, another um, group here on campus, and some that we've been building on our own recently. Uh, just by show of hands, who has been to a Decision Theater? Okay, perfect. So a few of you have. Um, this is a screenshot of our website, so if you're interested in learning more about what we do, please feel free to visit us um, at any time online. But I wanted to show you a couple of the visualizations and tools that we have here. So, Don, you want to talk about this one? Yes. So, one of the things that is very unique with what the Decision Center does, so I want you to imagine, if you will, the we create visualizations and tools that you could utilize anywhere, but one of the beautiful things is, is that there are these facilities that are a room full of screens that you can bring people into to look at visualizations and data that are coming from multiple sources that typically do not talk to each other. For instance, when I was a school superintendent, um, I had the ability, I mean, I was a pre-K-12 system, so I knew where these kids were from the minute they were four uh, till they graduated from high school. And then unless they come back and say to us, oh, thank you for all you my teachers did for me because I grew up and was able to go here, here, and here, other than anecdotally or through other survey methods, we truly have no idea. Our, when we say, how well are we doing preparing students for, for life beyond, where you prepare you to be college and career ready, how well do you actually do? Well, there are several databases, uh, there are several data points that exist to help make decisions that don't typically talk to each other. For instance, census data, um, demographic data, but there's also a database that allows us, and it's called the assist database that was created for another purpose, but actually monitors students um, in transfer credits for when they enter in any time after um, as an adult student, um, where they are and how they're going. So, so data scientists have taken multiple forms of data to begin allowing individuals who are close to the to a community, whether they are mayors or city government individuals or school educators, to see with all the existing data pieces what resources are there that will help us drive down. So one of our visualizations is our high school outcomes tool that allows us to see, we can take any, we can even take a legislative district, begin to look at it as a zip code, begin to look at what is the kind of income community degrees, um, resources that exist. What are some of the community factors? I mean, what is the lead paint exposure percentile? What kind of, uh, are they free and reduced lunches? And then we start looking at how do those kids do on college knowing and going? Did they complete the FAFSA? We also use this data to predictively begin to determine if you were to select a percentile, how many kids, sometimes it's five, um, the difference it would make to, to their lifetime earnings, which are in the hundreds of thousands, thousands to the communities, which is also substantial. So it allows uh, this high school outcomes tool 
takes all existing data that you may not have had at your fingertips and allows you to visualize it down to the area you're wanting to focus on, regardless of that group. And we've had educators and we've had state leaders who come at this and use this information for different purposes. So this is one of our visualizations. So most of our partners are K-12 um, districts throughout the state of Arizona. Um, and most of them experience this tool in one of the decision theaters. So the decision theater, if you are not familiar with it, there are two of them here in Arizona. There's one here at the Tempe campus. It's in the Brickyard building. Uh, and then the Helios Foundation has its own um, decision theater at their building off of Camelback and 32nd. So most of the time, partners have to schedule a time to come to one of those uh, theaters with us. We facilitate sort of a session with this. It, the, the theater, we call it the drum for short. It's probably about the size of this room, I'd say. Uh, and there are seven really large television monitors sort of in a semi-circle uh, shape around you. So you're really kind of immersed in this, in this data experience. If you've seen a movie where they are in some sort of like Pentagon control room or like a space station, that's sort of the vibe that you get when you're in the drum, okay? Um, no. So this high school outcomes tool is a tool that we built with decision theater, um, but we also have several other tools in our portfolio. This is the post-secondary feedback reports tool. This is what Don was mentioning, where it piggybacks off of this assist data warehouse. Essentially, if you graduate from a public high school in Arizona and you stay in state for post-secondary, we can follow you. We can see what happens. We can see what you study, what you major in, what your grades and your courses are, and we give that information back to high schools. We also have a tool that's looking at the impact of rigorous course taking. Um, so this is when you take a college level course in high school. If you think of something like advanced placement or dual enrollment, we've been looking at the impact of that. We have a couple of modules looking at the impact of the COVID pandemic on the state's K-12 system. Um, this one, that one is on enrollment. This one is on achievement and proficiency. Um, and then our newest tool uh, is a workforce tool that looks at the link between Arizona's education system and projections for Arizona's economy over the next decade. So I just show you those snapshots so you can kind of get a sense of the types of things, uh, the types of data tools that we sort of uh, work in. Um, this is a picture of the drum. So you can kind of see what I mean where they're, where they're, they're spread out around you, kind of surrounding you. This is a picture of the from the control room at the drum at the Helios campus, uh, and this is what the Helios building looks like um, from the street. If you haven't, if you haven't been there before, um, this brings us to kind of the reason that we're here today. So over the past couple of years, we've done a couple hundred of these sessions with some of our tools and various um, education partners. Like I said, mostly K twelve districts. Um, as Don and I have been going through this together, though, we started sort of noticing this, um, the same thing kind of happening over and over again. This building, the Helios building is where we do most of our sessions. It's, it's just easier for us to schedule there. The parking is free. It's There's a lot of um, things that make it just easier for us to work out of there. Has anyone in this room been to this building before? Okay, it's beautiful. One of the most common pieces of feedback that we get from people after they go to a session at the drum is you guys won't believe it there is a fountain in the parking garage but 
Examples to show the flexibility of the stand of art. State of the art, I mean, the bathrooms are probably the fanciest bathrooms that rival some of the most expensive places you and I have ever been to. Yeah, that's true. So you can And the first thing that you might tell somebody is. Uh, they have this amazing coffee maker and the whole place so wonderful. So if you have a kid to do this, oh my gosh, these are great deals. You'll need to reach out to me and schedule a time to come see. Parking lot. And that's kind of what Don and I started noticing together. We're like, We'd be at district meetings uh, later and people who'd been to the campus would say these things about the bathrooms, about the fountain. And we were like, well, wait, what about the, yeah, what about the data tool? Like, what was your big takeaway from the data tool that you saw? And so what we started to realize was, okay, maybe there's a different way we could go about approaching facilitating the use of our data visualizations. Uh, because of the design of the drum, the tools are really best seen in the drum. You can access them from a web browser, but it's it's just not the same. So with that in mind, Don and I started exploring from sort of our own ped pedagogy and curriculum backgrounds. Okay, what can we do about this space? What can we, what are the strengths of this space that we really need to be purposefully leveraging rather than letting the space sort of take control for us? Um, so that got us going down this pathway of, of museum education is sort of where we ended up um, in this exploration. So if you are a K-12 instructor, you have that background, or even if you have, have taught at the higher ed level before, you're probably familiar with a specific learning objective. So this is the idea that when you're teaching a course or you're teaching a concept, there's something very specific that you want your students uh, to be able to do by the end of your course uh, together. So if you know I'm teaching fifth grade math, it's something like by the end of fifth grade, the student will be able to multiply two digit by two digit numbers with fluency. Something like that. It's a very specific thing that you want students to do. What we started to realize was we had been kind of approaching the drum from that perspective. Okay, we've got we've got uh, Phoenix Union coming in. We have specific things we want them to take away from this time together. And we started to realize like that wasn't really working for us. Um, in our review of the literature, we came across this term general learning objective. This is something that came out of a project um, that this uh, um, academic Eileen Hooper Greenhill um, was working on when she was studying museum education in the UK. She started to realize that when people kind of visit these cultural institutions, the way that they interact with them is different than the way you interact in a classroom. Um, and we started to, to shift our thinking to maybe the drum is more like a museum or a cultural institution than it is like a classroom. We'll talk a little bit more about, about um, what that means. Do you want to talk a little bit about these? So one of the things that we began looking at was kind of the plus deltas. What are the amazing things that happen when people come to the drum? And what are the things we want to increase the likelihood of? And we began to focus around these ideas of we want there to be this general increase in their knowledge and understanding of what these tools are and what to do with them. And, and that and we're going to have to be very intentional about not just impressing you with it, but helping you understand it so that you know what to do with it on your own how to navigate it and come back to that for instance um, increasing your skills so that you are more knowledgeable about what this is and again all of these things are key ingredients or fundamental components of what made good learning outcomes if you will for these museum general learning objectives um, changing attitudes or values and appreciation of an excitement for I mean think about some of the incredible institutions you may have had the experience to be in you think about them you know they were very intentionally designed to leave you with an impact hopefully you they bring you back um, because you were enjoying yourself you were inspired there was creativity that we help inspire that in you which will then lead you to with what you now know or have been exposed to doing something with or differently because of what you know and how you know it. Um, and that was sort of our framing of how do we take what we know about these key ingredients that exist in, in institutions and make that part of who we are and what we do as well as this beautiful facility and these amazing visualizations. 
I think for me, one of the biggest sort of aha moments I had through this whole kind of re-envisioning process was when I sort of let go as the facilitator in these sessions that I was immediately responsible for these teachers, principals, leaders from a district to immediately go make a decision that I thought would be best because I had seen their data a million times. If you think about the way that a person interacts with something like a museum, you don't owe the museum any, you don't owe the museum anything. When you go through the exhibits, it's like they've sort of curated things in a specific way. But really, we might all have a different reason for going through one of these cultural institutions from our own background, our own experiences, just even how that day started for us, right? You might be picking up on something that someone else in your group might not. So when we start to shift our thinking of the drum to be more like that, like, okay, we can we can control as many of these factors as possible to, to set our participants up for success. But really after that, you know, we have to sort of trust them to be the experts that they are because these are their schools, they are their communities. Um, this is kind of a throwback, but if you have some, you know, kind of K-12 teaching here in the U.S., you've probably heard of John Dewey before. Uh, John Dewey is a very influential thinker on American um, public schooling and education. And in our research, I pulled this, this uh, quote, or not quote, but this um, description of some of his thinking on museums themselves. So Dewey was very much one of these sort of like, um, saw the social value in education, saw public schools as, as an institution that had a duty not only to the students that were there, but also to the community at large. Uh, he would be considered a constructivist in education, that students should be building meaning um, from the experiences that they have in a classroom. And so he talked about museums in, in a very, very similar way. Um, that museums should be focused on the local life outside the school. Uh, they've been used to organize and analyze the results of experience and that they should grow out of life experiences and be used to reflect back on life. Like when you go to a museum, it's a special event, right? It is part of your community, but it also allows you to simultaneously step out of your community for a brief period of time and sort of reflect back on it. So we started thinking about treating the drum in the same way. And I, and I think that participants they really led us to that path. Like when teachers come to see one of the visualizations, it's usually they're in like this sort of retreat mode, right? Like they've all kind of carpooled there. They've all stopped at Starbucks on the way. It's an event. It gets you out of the school building for half a day for a couple of hours. So there was already this sort of priming that our participants were doing in this same, um, in this same line of thinking. So here are the generic learning outcomes that Don had, had described to you before. Um, and this is from a visualization um, from the University of Leicester project I mentioned, the UK Museum Education Project, um, where they're just these sort of color coded here. So our next step was to try to assign the general learning outcomes to a typical session in the drum. Um, and here's, here's what we came up with. So there, before a redesign were three components to a typical drum visit, there was this kind of intake process. So typically somebody hears about the work that we do, they reach out to me or they reach out to Don and they say, hey, we wanna go to the drum. We wanna see high school outcomes tool, can we do that? Um, up to this point, it was really more of like logistic setting, right? Like what day works for you, here's when we can facilitate, all this sort of thing. Then there would be the drum session itself, which typically would last about two hours. We'd spend about an hour on the high school outcomes tool, that first screenshot you saw at the beginning, and the post-secondary feedback reports. Those are our sort of bread and butter visualizations. Um, you, you, sip, you typically sit in, that, in the drum space in rows and everyone's sort of facing the seven screens. Don or I are up there kind of facilitating like sort of Anna White style and we're like pointing at things and asking you questions, all that. Um, sometimes there's a lot of engagement, a lot of conversation, and sometimes there isn't. Sometimes it's really silent and people are just sort of staring at you, kind of, you know, how that goes. And we didn't really have a good way of knowing like how much impact we were making on them. And then the last part that existed beforehand was uh, the after visit. So typically we would send out kind of a survey about their experience in the drum. We'd maybe follow up with a couple of links on how to set up an account, all this sort of thing. Um, in this redesign, we've started assigning specific general learning, generic learning outcomes um, to each of the components. And we also added a fourth component, what we're calling the pre-show. Um, so here you can see each of the colors aligned with one of the GLOs and kind of where we, where we hit it during the whole experience. We decided that we wanted to make sure we could hit each of the GLOs twice, at least twice. 
So just to really um, kind of give ourselves plenty of opportunities for participants to have those experiences. So now on our in, actually, so now we'll go kind of through them one by one, I think. So I'll let you talk about the intake because this is more your forte. Okay, so the intake process, now we're being very, very intentional with this. So when someone reaches out and wants to bring a group there, one of the things is, is that they're, I'm going to work with them to help them deeply understand what they're coming for, what they're going to see, who are they, what, are, what questions are they hoping to answer, so that we can design our entire experience around uh, from the pre-show on uh, to really helping engage the individuals who are going to be there and also help get the right people in the room. Because sometimes the leader had heard from, sometimes it went like this, oh, have you seen Helios? Oh my gosh, that's really cool. You should take your team. That's a great before school activity. So they're, they're coming and they're ahaing from the first moment too. So one of the things we did was helped really set the stage with our intake process with the leader of what we're going to do. What do you want to answer? What are the kind of questions you want to get to so that we can customize your experience there with these tools and we can get the right people in the room. So that was something that we worked on very, very intentionally now that. Um, so the next uh, component is the newest one, pre-show. So this is something we're working on, in, on implementing right now. So because we're trying to shift our thinking to, you know, the drum is more of this experience, we want to set it up as a cultural institution. Um, we decided that we should play to the strengths. So instead of just sort of, you know, letting people walk by the fountain and us trying to like kind of breeze past that, we're, we're leaning into this space. So at the Helios campus specifically, there's the drum room, and then there's this kind of lobby part. There's this really nice sort of waiting area. Before this, we never use the waiting area because there's never like back-to-back -back showings in the drum. It's just us scheduling it, and then that's it for the day usually. So what we decided to do was implement this sort of pre-show component, similar to like when you maybe go on a ride at Disneyland, right? And you're waiting in line, but there are these elements there that are starting to set up the story for you. They're, they're starting to transition you from being in the real world to being into this like special experience. So what we're working on right now is some of the typical housekeeping stuff we do in the drum. So we'd have you come in, you'd sit down, and then we'd say where the bathrooms are. We'd say, you know, uh, what to expect, or we could say when you would have a break, that sort of thing. We're building in it to this sort of pre-show part. So we're working on filming this kind of like, uh, you know, hype video commercial type thing where you'll see it on the large TV in the lobby area first. We'll hand out some of the materials in advance. And then it's like the theater doors open. Right. And, you know, something special is about to begin because now you're entering and you're being ushered into this new space. And then you leave the theater and go, gosh, I wish I knew what I was going to go see because I would have prepared myself to be able to enjoy it. But um, there is a bit of that experience. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we're wanting to do is kind of get people hyped about this is what the drum is. This is what you're going to get to do in here. And you are the key ingredient to help make the drive and change. Hoping already set the expectation besides just information, you're going to give them a great experience that will give you the tools to be able to do this so that you are ready and prepared for coming in rather than figuring that out while you're sitting there. You kind of are ready to absorb and will be ready, probably already primed to think about the kind of work you're going to be doing with the bathroom. And that leads us to the drum session itself. So this is the main event. As you can see, all of the, the GLOs are, are stacked here. Um, so what Don and I are working on is how do we sort of reevaluate the way that we're presenting the visualizations themselves. So we're working on a, a companion workbook. So this is a snapshot of the current draft of it. So currently we've tried a few things before where maybe we give you some like note paper, we, we do a couple like worksheet type things, but nothing's like really stuck. So we're trying now an actual companion sort of material um, that will accompany each of the visualizations. It'll be like a sort of guidebook where it tells you like when you're looking at screen two, here are some, some prompts and some discussion starters, that sort of thing. So that's one big piece that we're working on um, implementing as well as sort of changing it from being rows like in a theater to more of, of pods and sort of cluster work, which, which we know is more of a best practice from um, the K-12 world, which is what most of our, our participants are coming from. And then, 
The last section is the after visit. Sorry, I think it's because of, I'll let you talk a little bit about after. So one of the things too, is that oftentimes what happens is people come, you know how it's like information overload and you get all this information and you've seen these visuals and we've shown you now the other piece that we're building in there is how to log in, how to access this on your own. Because sometimes you see something and then you go home and you go, wait, how do I make this work? <laughs> Where do I go? Oh, that was really cool. How do I access that? Um, so we're trying to set that stage there with you before you leave. But then one of the things we're trying to do is capture that energy, that spark. So go with challenging people. We primed you that you're going to need to know something. You're, you're going to go from seeing something to focusing on. So what are you going to do with this? We're looking at building into the session, an opportunity for the individuals to tap their future self. You know how sometimes we say this is future Don's problem. Um, so, so, Hey Don, what did you, you're going to, channel yourself today. What do you want to remind yourself? Have you done with? What did you do with? Where are you with this? Um, as a takeaway, it does two things. It's multifaceted. It allows the facilitator to get like almost a quick assessment, if you will will of how did each individual individual person take this? You know, it's fun and for me is watching, being new to this team and watching how different individuals from the same organization based upon the roles that they have take the very same information and have a very different specific learning outcome for themselves. Let me give you an example. We have a school district where the PR team realized, oh my gosh, most of the, there's a huge percentage of the kids in this community whose grandparents are raising them. Grandparents aren't looking at Twitter. They're not looking at, um, you know, Instagram for parent communication. So how are we going to do a better job with communicating with the our clientele, if you will. That looked very different than the math team who going, oh my gosh, we're underperforming compared to our peers. Um, our kids aren't doing very well at the community college uh, compared to our neighboring district or our neighboring school that has identical demographics. What are they doing? How are they doing it? We need to talk. So we're asking for each individual person to, what is your goal? What will you do with this information? And you're going to jot it down for yourself. So Chris, talk about our talented little group who helped us put these beautiful cards together. So what you're seeing on the screen is a collection of these post-visit um, uh, postcards that we're starting to implement here. So we have a, a few student employees, um, ASU students, who work for our center. And what we did was we tasked them with designing postcards that participants will send to themselves after visiting the drum and participating in one of the sessions. So. You'll see DC edX is um, kind of the shorthand that we use to refer to our center itself, Decision Center for Educational Excellence. Um, so you can see there are a couple there that are themed to the, the entire center. That's the Helios building again. Um, then there are two, um, one for each of the main visualizations we show. So post-secondary feedback reports, and this one, the high school outcomes tool. So at the end of the session, when participants are kind of reflecting or setting a goal for themselves, okay, based on something I saw here today, this is what I'm gonna do. As Don said, they write it down on the back of the postcard. There's all these like sentence frames um, on the back. And then we hold them. And then in six weeks later, we mail them out to the participants who have self-addressed it um, on the front of the postcard as just one way to sort of, again, start to build in that self-accountability. Um, and then also kind of reinstate the fact that like, we're here for you. We're a resource. You're out in the, in the school buildings doing the hard work every day. This is a special place that you can stay connected to um, as it as it works for you. And that way you get a sense of what they personalize for themselves. It allows us to monitor are there questions or things that you will use for us so that's a summary of some of the changes that we're currently putting into place here. I'm sorry, I don't know why this is not. Um, and all of this is in service of these kind of key ideas here. So 
We believe that the visualizations that we have, they must be skillfully facilitated and connections must be made for there to be meaningful impact. In the um, partners that we mainly work with, like I said, K-12 um, educators, we what we're finding is it, we want to be part of their team, right? It's unrealistic to expect them to both be um, experts in education, experts in instruction, experts in their own personal community, and experts in interpreting and analyzing data. Right? It's too much. That's not really the way that the system is set up. So speaking to an audience who are here at a data conference, I'm sure this is something you can probably relate to. Our job is to go through, find the data, make the connections, do the analysis, and then present it to people in a way that makes sense to them and is useful for their jobs. We also believe that we must set our visitors up for success and make our tools easy to access and use outside of the drum or the theater. This is something that we are working on. As I said, because of the, the setup that we have, these tools are really best seen in, that set, in the drum. But there's only two in Arizona, and they're both like 20 minutes from each other. So if you live here in the Valley, we see a lot of repeat customers. But we've had groups come from other parts of Arizona, and it is honestly like a multi-day trek for them. Uh, last year, we had um, all of the superintendents from Navajo and Apache County come down the drum day overnight, two days to make it worth it because it's you know five, six hours of driving for them to come down here and sit in the sit in the drum. So that's something we're trying to, to think through moving forward here, how we can improve access. Uh, and then lastly, we believe that we must create the learning experience for participants that makes them want to come back and see these tools again. Just like in your experiences with museums or public libraries, it's not something that you go to once and you're like, I'm done. I don't need to go back there. I know everything that there is to know about whatever this topic is. Every time you go, you sort of notice something new, right? Or you have a different purpose for visiting. So there's something specific you want to focus on. That's what we want this resource um, to really be for our partners um, and, and for our teammates. So um, I hope that that was interesting for you. I hope it's useful in some of your own work. Um, we're happy to talk more about any of the kind of things that led us to where we are now. Um, but with the time that we have left, we'd love to answer any of your questions, um, whether it's about the specific, you know, redesign of how we present in the drum or about any of the tools um, themselves. Thank you very much for, for your time and for your attention.
So yes, this is from the micro to the macro level, these visualizations are having an impact on outcomes. And one of the things we want to do is have them go back and that's where the partnership comes. If you begin to see there's something in the slide that when we bring the teams and key speakers into the room, we may have the data, but all of a sudden they have the story behind that. But we have to be very careful about it's not a jumping to an assumption. And then we can study that further. Let us help you begin to look at what the resources and tools that we have behind the scenes here at ASU to help support you in really studying that phenomenon rather than that just assumption. So again, I think we kind of Yeah. <laughs> so we didn't talk too much about the actual construction of the visualizations. Um, it really depends. So that first one, the high school outcomes tool, that's all publicly available data. It's largely coming from the Census Bureau, um, the Arizona Department of Education, and a couple other public sources. Um, the other main one we have, PSFR, post-secondary feedback reports, that's coming through the Assist Warehouse, which is run by a group called AZ Transfer, um, which is a big you know, player in the state, and um, student-level data from Arizona Department of Education. So because of that, we can only show it to um, those with an educational interest in those students. So typically that means that if you work at this specific school or district, you have an account that lets you see only the data for your school or district. data sharing agreements because as you know I mean as you watch any news story right now the security of individualized data how are we utilizing that as a contribute group but one of the impact projects we have is a personalized submission project where this started as um, there was school district that said listen I have these up kids who are ready to come to college but they are they're financially just with their application fee will stop them from from doing this and so through these agreements, we've been able to go from one district to only just half district in the state, where uh, uh, where basically we have an intermediate step between the school districts at EDE and ASU, where we look at it, and now all three universities, the nation, the UVA, and EDE, there are high school students who just got letters who who didn't apply, but now have the opportunity because of their data that already existed at the local level, the right. That makes a big difference for some of these communities who may never supply. So all of a sudden, I have three universities where I'm eligible to go to, and there's information about my financial status um, matters. So there are no costs to use any of our tools. So we're funded largely through a grant from the Helios Foundation. Um, so we don't charge for access to any of the, of the things that we provide. And we also don't charge for access to the facility itself. The only thing we charge for is if you want to have lunch at the Helios campus, you're on your own dime for that. Um, we typically, like I said, work with K-12 districts across the state. That's sort of our main charge. But we do often work with other um, groups and centers that are focused on education in the state of Arizona. <laughs> okay well thank you very much for your time uh don and i will stick around for a while if you want to talk to us individually about anything or get any more contact info um but yeah thanks enjoy your day and i hope you enjoy the conference as well